So here we are in the third and I believe final actual microbiology lecture. So we'll quickly go over a few things in here. It's a pretty short one. Uh, so uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Virology, that's what we're starting with today. So virology is the study of viruses, in case you didn't know that. All right, got it, moving on. There are lots of methods to detect viruses. The most common is one that we talked about in the lecture on immunodiagnostic techniques, and that's ELISA. Of course, what's ELISA that we use every single day in clinic called? Those are called snap tests. There are, other, I th there are other methods, and I am going to very quickly go over them because you will not see these normally. These are um, occasionally done when viruses need to be sent out uh, to referral labs for, for these sorts of things. Um, so there are other methods of detecting viruses. So there's virus is isolation. There are demonstration of viral particles by electron microscopy. There's immunohistochemical staining of tissue samples. There are molecular tests. Viruses can be cultured, but uh, if you know anything about viruses, you will know that they cannot live on their own. They require living cells to grow and replicate. So sorry, they can sort of live on their own, but they cannot replicate. Um, without cells, uh, uh, basically a cell culture medium to grow in. So we have to use animal cell lines that we grow in vitro and we, we can incubate um, uh, viruses in those. Viral detection methods are categorized into two sections. There are antibody-based tests, and these are the ones that we already talked about. So these are our, our ELISAs. They check for antigens or antibodies, depending what we're looking for. Um, and then there are molecular methods. So we can detect viral DNA, essentially, directly. Antibody-based tests, the one we know about, of course, being ELISA. Uh, so we have an antibody or antigen that's bound to a solid carrier. We're incubating a, a sample on the membrane or in the well. Uh, we have primary antibody binding with a viral antigen in the sample. We wash the membrane or well, add a labeled secondary antibody specific to the antigen we're looking for, incubate it till they bind together, and then we wash it again and add substrate for the enzyme and the amount of enzyme activity that we see correlates to the amount of virus present. And we usually see that in a color change. Virus isolation is uh, test that we can do directly from a patient sample or we can culture. Um, so primary cells are isolated from the animal or we can use cells that are previously immortalized for propagation in vitro. We have to culture the cells themselves. Um, this requires often biosafety equipment. This is obviously not done in clinic. Uh, often involves incubators with carbon dioxide in the proper concentration. So again, not done in clinic. Um, then we culture the viruses themselves. So the patient sample will actually be filtered to remove bacteria, and then the sample will be inoculated onto those cultured cells. They get incubated, and then we look at the cell, the changes in the cells. Electron microscopy, very cool. I always love the pictures that come out of electron microscopy. Of course, they don't actually come out colored. That's added afterwards just for effect, but really neat, eh? So this is a bacteriophage um, virus. They, well, they affect bacteria typically, and they look like these little lunar landing module things. They're really neat. Um, and then this is a more typical kind of flu type virus. Viruses are just so cool looking under an electron microscope. Basically, we look at infected culture cells or patient samples for the viral presence. So we're looking directly for the virus itself under the electron microscope. Um, I'm not going to really go into it further than that because very few of you will ever work anywhere where there is an electron microscope. I just like the pictures. PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It's a process by which a specific sequence of DNA is replicated or amplified in a series of steps. Um, in order for it to be detected and quantified. Um, so you can see the diagram over here. This is our target sequence of DNA that we're looking for. We heat it, we separate the DNA strands, then we get these primers on here, we replicate it, and basically we keep replicating the part of d the DNA that we're interested in until we've got a bunch of it and we can, we can actually positively detect it and quantify it because viruses are usually present in such a tiny amount. I mean, in terms of size wise and that sort of thing, it can be hard to to, to detect it without um, doing a PCR 
and we can use this to test for specific viral DNA. So if, if we do go through PCR and the right viral DNA is there, then we're going to get that propagation and we're going to get a level that we can detect. Lots of different detection methods use PCR as a foundation. It's no longer necessary to grow bacteria or virus in culture for sequence information, which is nice. Um, it can be used to identify obligate intracellular bacteria or viruses. Um, it can detect slow growing organism and uh, it, it can we can perform basically diagnostic tests without maintaining viral or bacterial stock, so that's important. We don't really want to have pathogenic viruses and bacteria just hanging around. Uh, just a quick note on DNA sequencing. I'm not actually really going to talk about this. Basically, it can be used to identify pathogens, but it's not performed in most veterinary practices. So basically, if you ever needed to send something away for DNA sequencing, you would have instructions from the external lab that would tell you how to go about preparing and sending the sample. So I will trust you to uh, learn as you go when you need to. This is not something that's too terribly important um, in everyday practice. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about a microbiological concern that is a big concern for most of us uh, in practice, and that's nosocomial infections. So some of you might remember what nosocomial means and some of you might not. So these are infections that are acquired from a hospital environment from another patient or a healthcare provider. There are a few contributing factors you should remember. Um, so those patient related factors, and that would be things like um, an immunocompromised patient potentially could be susceptible to this type of infection. Pathogen related factors. So say a pathogen lives on lives really a long time on inanimate objects, so fomites, and so it can be easily transmitted that way. Um, maybe there's an environmental issue, things aren't getting cleaned properly, or maybe it's veterinary personnel not washing their hands properly. Uh, so these sorts of things can um, can certainly contribute and do to nosocomial infections. There are two forms of these infections. There's virulent ones, and there's what we call opportunistic infections. So patients become susceptible to nosocomial infections, obviously when they're hospitalized. And when there's stress, so hospitalization causes stress in a lot of our patients. So they're out of their normal environment. This can suppress their immune system. They may have underlying disease, so diabetes, hypothyroidism, they may be undergoing chemotherapy, and those can all suppress the immune system. And that makes patients, again, more susceptible to acquiring diseases. Maybe their vaccines aren't up to date. This is why, for instance, I always want to vaccinate indoor cats for FERCP, because if they're coming into the clinic and they're stressed and they have to be hospitalized and their vaccines aren't up to date, well, guess what? They're probably going to get an upper respiratory infection on top of whatever else is going on, and that's not going to be good for anybody. Ironically, antimicrobials, so antibiotics, can actually predispose the patient to infections. It, they alter or they reduce normal floras that prevent pathogen colonization. So if you, ha if you have an animal, say you're going to be boarding that animal in a clinic for a few days, you don't want to give it prophylactic antibiotics to try to prevent Bornatella or something like that, right? Um, it's just going to predispose to other bacterial infections. These infections can be caused by virulent pathogens or opportunistic organisms. So, so I mentioned that. Well, opportunistic organisms is an organism that normally would do harm to a patient, but here are hospitalized. They're stressed. They may have some or all of those situations gone that we talked about other people's life. Uh, the organism will in this cause them because the patient come in your mind. Uh, and those infections can transfer not from patient to patient, but fomites, so inanimate that have caused infection to patient. So food masks can reverse their mother. Always wear hands is huge. This is something I forget sometimes in because well, it's small, it's not going to be giving as I mean, if it were zoomed to the fifth or not. Um, so, yeah, this is not some cause of disease. What are you bringing next to patient? What are you taking on animal? Always wash your patients. Well, actively and significantly reduce the reduction of path between and between patient giver. Just don't and come complacent. Things happen, infections happen. Um, they are.
causes the most common meals. Bacteria commonly, they often intestinal, respiratory tract, and the skin. So viruses also can cause these infections. They're the second most common cause. Uh, things like canine distemper, parvovirus, panleukopenia, equine influenza, equine herpes virus. These are some of the most common viruses that are involved. Um, Respiratory viruses, of course, as we all know, are common and easily spread because they spread through aerosol. So this is why isolation wards are so important because isolation wards um, usually basically suck in the air. They have negative pressure. They suck in the air from the rest of the clinic, meaning they're not spitting the air out into the rest of the clinic. Um, so that way it prevents um, airborne transmission. Uh, at least of these upper respiratory viruses or, or lower respiratory viruses. Uh, you can get fungi and parasites that can also cause nosocomial infections, although this is much less common. So how do you control nosocomial infections? Uh, you can suspect a nosocomial infection if a lot of hospitalized patients start showing the same symptoms. Well, that's kind of a obvious that that could happen. This would be more common in uh, the type of clinic where a, a lot of patients are staying for an extended period of time, uh, or at least a few days. Sometimes what we see is we see animals that have been in clinic um, for even just one day uh, and they're coming back, you know, five days later with an upper respiratory infection or something like that. We do see that. That was probably a nosocomial infection. How do we respond? early recognition. This will help prevent patient morbidities, so it'll prevent further spread. Source identification. Where is this infection coming from? Is it from a patient? Is it from a fomite? Is it from a staff member? Is it that people aren't washing their hands? They're not cleaning equipment properly? Really important to, to find out. And there's a multiple intervention approach you can take, and that means you disinfect patient housing, equipment, the treatment areas, use isolation, basically try to get at it from all different ways and always, always, always through everything, always wash your hands and that will often take care of it for you. All right, so that's it for microbiology.